Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. This is the Chopping It Up Show, brought to you by the Marching Podcast and Blog Talk Radio. I'm your official Marching Podcast announcer, David Thompson, and here's your host, the Phantom Podcaster himself, Joe Beard. Good evening and welcome to Chopping It Up. I am your host, Joe Beard, and happy to be of service for you tonight. Today is October 29th, 2013, 6 o'clock on the West Coast and 9 o'clock on the East Coast. We appreciate all those listening live and or those listening in podcast form, whether through iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, or through our website. At the end of this broadcast, if you decide you like the show, then we appreciate a donation to the network, if you feel so in your heart, of course. Just simply go to themarchingpodcast.com and click on the donate button to help improve the show and build our scholarship fund. All right, so we are in the last week of October now, and it has been a good month. Make sure you go to our website, themarchingpodcast.com, and vote on our Week 9 featured matchup uh, winner, it is the Magic City Classic that was uh, Alabama State University versus Alabama A&M. Please vote on who you think won that battle, uh, whether on the field, in the stands, and or both. We will read the results on the 90 Degree Show this Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern. So tonight we are going to chop it up with Dr. David A. Paget. I met Dr. Paget. Um, <clears throat> I think back in 2004, a uh, really good person um, and someone that vaulted me to my career now in the field of um, geographic information systems. Uh, geographic information systems is a series of software that gives sp- spatial information. And what I mean by that is the information, that uh, spatial information, is based on location. So, you know, geography might be the most undervalued discipline that we as people use and interact with every day. You know, where is something located? How do you get there? Where do you live? Uh, neighborhoods, communities, et cetera, et cetera. Geography is a part of our everyday lives. Nowadays, when young people study geography, it's still the rivers and knowing all your capitals, et cetera. But you will learn about computers which is super significant nowadays. I got into GIS because after getting my undergrad in history, I wanted to learn more about the maps and the pictures that I was seeing there in all of my history reports or in the history books that I was reading. I then did more research and found out that less than 7% minorities in this country have a postgraduate degree in geography. So I felt this was my chance to make a difference and, you know, I guess be somewhat of a trailblazer to other young youths to consider a career in geography and or through GIS. Um, I finished grad school and I finished uh, my first job, which was a contract position in Florida. And I moved back to Charlotte, North Carolina to look for work. But I didn't see as many GIS jobs as I did in Nashville, Tennessee. OK. And then, of course, Nashville, I did my research and, you know, you have Tennessee State right there. I then started to look at Tennessee State as like, you know, a possible job location or somewhere, you know, I could get to work and contribute and help build my career. And then saw that Tennessee State actually has a GIS lab by, run by a Dr. David A. Padgett. So I thought this was super cool that, you know, there was a GIS lab here at Tennessee State. When I was at Jackson State, there was some talk about starting the GIS lab or getting it going, but I'm not sure it took off, um, and I'm not sure where it is now. But Dr. Paget is the face of HBCU GIS. You know, he's a good guy. So you guys go out there and we'll learn and we'll hear from him tonight about contacting him and whatnot. But Dr. Paget also gave me my first opportunity to teach at the college level. I taught world regional geography at Tennessee State, and at the time I found out that I was really – I wasn't ready for that position. I was too young really for that position, and I was happy for the opportunity, 
But now, you know, being mature now, I guess I could say, or more mature than I was back then, it prepared me for uh, being a teacher's assistant at University of California, Riverside. And I'll be teaching physical geography at Crafton Hills College uh, in the sp- starting the spring of 2014. And without those uh, opportunities before in the past, especially with Dr. Padgett, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to have those opportunities now. And, you know, all this started when I was searching and preparing to be in the GIS field, you know. And basically when I moved to Nashville, you know, there were a lot more opportunities, but still at the same time I felt that I had a good contact there with the GIS lab being there at Tennessee State and knowing who Dr. Padgett was. I figured that this was a good way to go. Uh, I moved to Nashville, met him, and basically he helped me on my way. Um, I later got a job here. I actually was working there in Nashville as a at a business partner for my current company ESRI, and then um, <clears throat> I actually just a- applied, you know, to the to the mother company. And uh, long story short, got the job here. They moved me out here, and it was a a really good opportunity because you know, uh, you know, it's you know they were moving me, but this is the number one company in the world for GIS and you know having that on your resume and just working there you have much more uh world GIS experience in the real world um much more you get more there at ESRI than you know any other company so it's just a really good thing and they also have the user conference every year where uh HBCU GIS headed by Dr. Paget meets up um and uh I think they go out to dinner and just you know fellowship with each other but you know we're, we're at the user conference. You're talking to vendors and sending out resumes and fellowshipping and getting your face and your name out there in the field. Um, and I believe Dr. Padgett is there every year, and I hope to see him next year, um, you know, if I get a chance to get out here. It seems like every year I always get slammed or something keeps me on campus during, you know, the time of the conference. And don't get me wrong. It's peaceful here <clears throat> with everyone gone <laughs> during this time, and, and, and I don't mind not going. But I definitely have to get away just to touch base with Dr. Padgett. I believe that HBCU GIS started as an email alias, but now there's an alias and the Facebook page where Dr. Padgett uh, posts videos, articles, and pictures and great things relevant to the field. Um, You know, the alias is good because, you know, you get to meet you, you get to meet people. Um, you see when jobs pop up at certain schools and then just seeing the young people posting their resumes and, you know, you can see what they're getting into. Um, I've I've met two people from the HBCU GIS. Uh, one person, Nakia Young, I believe she went to Jackson State first and then she transferred to Tennessee State. Um, but I remember meeting her because Dr. Padgett always spoke very highly of her and uh, met her in San Diego one year. And uh, also Dante Ferry, Fairley, uh, he went to – he's a new uh, – or a, a Kappa, I'm a Kappa for all those that for know what that is. And uh, Kappa Alpha Psi, he's a member of Kappa Alpha Psi. And I got to meet him uh, when he came to Redlands. He came to Redlands for like a project that he was working on, and uh, and and we went out and kicked it for a second. So it was cool to, to meet her and him, and they're both working in the field respectively. Um, out doing good things for GIS. So uh, it was good just to meet another contact through the HBCU do alias, you know. And it's just a real blessing uh, just to to know Dr. Pageant has really helped me out. I'm, I'm eternally grateful. And so, you know, I definitely want to do this interview to bring some attention to the field so that everyone knows what a good job Dr. Pageant is doing. And maybe there's some young people out there that want to get involved in geography and GIS. Definitely we need more minorities involved in the field, but it's a great field. Um, You would be surprised at uh, the field of geography and what it does for you. And maybe there's a lot of us that are good at geography. We just don't know because, you know, geography is just not out there, um, you know, out in the forefront so much where, you know, we're going to say, hey, Ma, I want to I want to go in geography when I grow up, you know. So hopefully maybe this interview and just bringing some attention will uh, will open some of our eyes and just, you know, give open more doors for our young people. 
This will be a podcast, but we will accept your calls at 718-664-6025. You can email the show at marchingpodcast at gmail.com. Tweet us at marchingpodcast. Follow our blog, blog the number four dot the marching podcast dot com. If you're listening live now, we have a uh, and you have a blog talk radio account. You can log in into the chat room at the bottom and uh, leave your comments there. It looks like one person is in. It looks like a couple of people are in there in the chat room. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being there. I'll type you guys something here when I get a free hand here in a minute. Um, but definitely, um, and last, and definitely, but not least, check out the website, themarchingpodcast.com. dot com. Let's take the time to hear from our sponsors. Tonight's show is brought to you by Liquid Effects Photography, Block Band Music, uh, Bandhead dot org, Big Deal Fundraising, and HBCUs dot net. Let's take the time to hear from them now. Attention high school directors and alumni. Does your band need to raise money to travel, buy instruments or uniforms? Are you looking to raise money to help your band? Well, Big Deal Fundraising is rapidly becoming one of the largest distributors of fundraising products in the industry. Big Deal is based in New York City and ships anywhere in the United States. Offering quality products, fast delivery, and innovative consultation that will help you meet your fundraising goals. Call today at 855-244-4430 or visit us at BigDealFundraisingUSA.com. Big Deal Fundraising, your fundraising partner for your band or music ensemble. What if there was a Facebook for bands? Wait a minute, there is. Bandhead.org. Bandhead.org is a social network for HBCU show bands. You can create your own profile and post videos, photos, and comments on Bandhead.org. Need somewhere to post events, audition schedules, job postings? Check out Bandhead.org. Are you recruiting for talent? Go to Bandhead.org. And coming this fall... HBCUBands.com. Write that down. HBCUBands.com. Block Band is a minority owned music business that you can think of as your assistant band director. We help grow your musicians with a great selection of traditional concert band music. Then we back up their performance with necessities like reeds, oil, drum heads, drumsticks, and mallets. Finally, we outfit your players in auxiliary and shoes, spats, and gloves that match our precise custom drills. Got band? If so, then Block Band's got you. Check BlockBandMusic.com or call us at 919-698-2560. That's BlockBandMusic.com, 919-698-2560. Do you know where to find scholarship information and other financial resources that are available to HBCU students? Are you up to date on the latest information in the HBCU world? If you answer no to any of these questions, then HBCU News with the Reads is the place for you. We provide information to spark interest, success stories of graduates, and the latest on issues that you care about. So check out HBCU News with the Reads, Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on blogtalkradio.com forward slash marching podcast. Check out our website and point your browser toward hbcunews.net and join in on the calls and discussion today. Having an anniversary party, birthday party, or better yet, you're about to marry that special someone? Liquid Effects Photography is the perfect choice to immortalize all your most special moments. With 10 years of dependable professional service that can deliver from the conventional to the best in cutting-edge technology and creativity. Come experience the uniqueness of Liquid Effects Photography. We serve the entire upper Midwest and will travel further upon request. Come check us out at liquideffects.com. That's L-I-Q-U-I-D-E-F-F-E-X.com. Or call us at 773-454-5556. That's 773-454-5556. Okay, we're back, and uh, I have playing now Tennessee State University playing The Feds is Washing. I figured that this would be good transition music for someone employed there at Tennessee State, representing Tennessee State. We're back, and we're ready to chop it up with Dr. Padgett. You can do so with the number you see on your screen now at 718-664-6025. We can take those calls after playing of the interview. 
go ahead and stop this now. So without further ado, let's go ahead and chop it up with Dr. David A. Patrick. You're now here in the Marching Podcast, and we have Dr. David Padgett. Um, how are you doing today, Dr. Padgett? I'm doing okay. I really appreciate your time. Dr. Padgett is like the, I guess, the creator or the owner, so to speak, of an alias that I'm a part of. I am um, uh, involved in geography. My, my master's is in geography and uh, geographical information systems is really important and something we want to inform the community about so more of our kids will be interested in geography. And uh, Dr. Padgett, man, I, I just say that I met you. I remember after I finished grad school and I was about to move to Nashville, um, looking at Tennessee State, I saw like you, and geography, I, I saw your name and all the things that you were doing there at the research department and um and and your lab there and and uh, it's been it's been really nice to meet you and I've uh, kept up with you over the years um so it's really great to uh <clears throat> to have you on here and I really want to uh like put use this stage to talk about GIS um to our youth so um so let's go ahead and get started um where are you from Dr. Padgett? Uh, I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. Now, um, uh, now, what high school did you attend there in Baltimore? Uh, at Milford Mill High School. Okay. Okay. Now, um, where did you um, where did you go off to college uh, from Baltimore? I uh, went to uh, Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Okay. Now, what made you pick uh, Bowling Green? Uh, back then. We had, a, um, well, the school counselors had, I guess, these, uh, I don't think they were computer programs, but they were uh, something like that that basically took, um, you know, the size of the school you wanted. Back then I was running tracks, so, and I, I wanted to major in environmental studies, and then, the, and then you know, you had a price range of tuition, and that school met all, you know, was amongst, I guess, 10 that, fit the criteria uh the closest and so that's where I ended up ended up going. Okay, that's why that's interesting. So <clears throat> there you said that you wanted to you wanted to major in environmental science. Is that right? Yeah, I pretty much um knew what I wanted to major in in college from about the time I was fifteen or sixteen. There was never any doubt that I wanted to be in environmental science in some way, shape or form. I just had to find a school that you know, had the major, which wasn't easy back then. Um, there weren't a whole lot of schools that had environmental science as a uh, major, um, which is, you know, I really wanted to go to an HBCU, but back then, you know, no HBCUs really had any semblance of environmental science. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's the only reason I didn't go to an HBCU because I, you know, I absolutely knew I wanted to major in environmental science. You know, of course, now I would have lots of choices, FAMU, North Carolina A&T, uh, you name it, but, you know, it is what it is. So that's where I went um, to Western Kentucky University because they had the environmental science uh, program and the track team and, the, you know, everything else. That I, school, I didn't want to go to a big school like University of Maryland or University of Michigan, but then I didn't want to go to a little small school. So it was back then we had about ten thousand students. It was just about the right size. Right, I, I totally understand that. So um, that's actually really cool that you knew at fifteen or sixteen what you wanted, and you know you were able to pursue that because I I was definitely all over the place at that age. So. Um, when uh so so did you know that you wanted to be a professor per se like when you say environmental science you know you wanted to be in the field but did you know like specifically what uh like your job title you what it was going to be yeah i mean basically i i thought at the time that i would wind up working with the uh environment protection agency or us geological survey or uh, and i actually did work for the us bureau of land management um right out of college uh, in environmental protection. So uh, I was doing basically what I wanted to do. I was mainly uh, inspecting 
help us inspect the mine, mine, mines, big gold mines and silver mines and um, all hazardous waste spills. And, and also at that time, uh, the PC was just coming out around that time in the 80s. And in fact, when I started working was when the federal government first got PC. So it was really interesting. And, and they were really hiring a lot of, I guess, younger people because a lot of the older managers, you know, they weren't using computers. I mean, people still had those old IBM Selectric typewriters on the desk. And uh, so it was a transitionary period. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the things that were in paper form were now in uh, being changed over to, to database. I think we were using um, Lotus back then, the old, old Lotus software. Um, and so yeah, it was an interesting period of, you know, t transition in terms of technology. And, and, and GIS was really crude back then. I think we had maybe some of the raster versions, our resolutions. I mean, we were working sometimes with one mile resolution, <laughs> a quarter mile resolution, you know, <laughs> before it did anything like that. <laughs> and so, and we thought that was like cutting edge, you know. Right. And then the vector stuff was just, just in... I mean, there were like no base layers, nothing. I mean, we were, we were creating the base layers were just being created back then. So it, it was really, um, um, and then some of the GIS programs are very specialized. Like we had grass uh, that was almost exclusively uh, for federal land. I mean, this, so it was a really interesting time. So, wow. But yeah, so I guess I had an advantage in. You know, I wasn't like, oh, what am I going to major in? I mean, I knew exactly what I wanted to major in. So, so it wasn't. Um, and I wound up in geography kind of by accident. I was in, um, actually, I was in environmental engineering science uh, for about two years, and then that program was discontinued. But in environmental engineering science, my um, my area of focus was water resources engineering, and so. A lot of those courses were cross listed with uh, geography, physical geography, and geology, and so I was able to change, well, get a new major, um, and not. I think I only had to stay maybe an extra semester because of that. Instead, of, I didn't know how much longer I'd be, you know, with engineering being so specialized. But luckily, a lot of those classes were cross listed in geography and geology, so that's how I ended up in geography and in, in geography. And then in my last, so that extra semester that I had to stay, that's when I took my first GIS course. And it, it wasn't anything. They, this was even before um, um, ESRI was even really well known um, as far as with mapping. And so a program, we used a program called Tetronics, and there was another one. I don't even remember. This is a, a long time ago, but... <laughs> But they were, you know, you did kind of crude overlays. They were really almost more CAD than GIS. But um, but I, I had taken a lot of CAD in engineering, so I already they kind of gave me an advantage, of really knowing how to manipulate the graphics. But then um, connected it to the database or attribute table, it was you know very crude back then. So, but that, that's where it's that's where I started, um, and then I went to work for the BLM, uh, and then I got a chance to do a, a research, uh, I had a research post at Oak Ridge National Lab uh, where we were uh, further developing uh, GIS software specifically for the Environmental Protection Agency uh, at Superfund sites. So that, that was a very interesting experience because you got to, I got to see some of the, um, you know, very much cutting edge GIS technology as it was being developed and helped to develop it myself. So, and after that, I went back out to California. Um, uh, and then eventually, for whatever reason, um, anyway, I, I, I was, my position at um, the BLM was, was terminated. Um, and then I was fl floated around for a while trying to figure out what I was going to do. I really wanted to stay in California. Uh, but then I guess it looked like the handwriting was on the wall to go to um, back to school because, you know, it was the 80s. It was kind of still kind of a recession. And, you know, California is a tough state to find work.
work, and especially at that time. Well, if if I if I, if I wanted to stay in the environmental field, which I absolutely wanted to, so you know, I interviewed with the state, I interviewed with I interviewed with some uh, uh, local governments, and municipal governments. Nothing was working out. I was running out of money, and so I wound up uh, going to graduate school at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and so I got a uh, McKnight Fellowship. Uh, so I was, um, and, and the University of Florida has, a, you know, this very, very strong environmental science. They environmental do. Yeah, they do. And so, um, but of course, because my undergrad, well, my undergrad degrees were in geography, but because I had somewhat of an engineering background, I was still able to, um, I was able to, um, uh, my master's is my minor for my master's is environmental engineering. So I was able to get back into some engineering a little bit um, while I was working on my master's. And, but you know, so we, so being at the University of Florida was really, really a you know a great experience. Um, you know, so in terms of. You know, and, and 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 that's where I really learned more GIS because I had a, an assistantship with the um, I can't remember what it was, and it wasn't in um, my college. You would think it was in AG. It might have been in AG, that School of Agriculture, at the University of Florida. But well, but my job was to um, use Arc Info to uh, digitize the wetlands for the entire state of Florida. <laughs> so, wow. By hand, with no scanner. I mean, oh my goodness! I mean, it was, and, and my my um, supervisor really didn't know. He just handed me the manual and those <laughs> maps. They were actually uh, aerial photographs. <laughs> he said, get to work, you know. But um, that's how I learned. I mean, it was it was rough. I mean, I really didn't take any classes. It was just project work and working on my thesis. And um, but like I said, I never really thought about being in um, higher ed or academia at all. Um, and I had a chance after I got my master's to go to work for the state. The state of um, Florida was going to hire me um, to work on some of the same, um, well, actually, in my master's thesis, I developed a method to uh, use remote sensing to predict uh, um, sinkhole collapses beneath highways. And so... Um, they wanted me to go to work for the state. The state did, um, and they wanted to adopt that methodology. But I just, uh, I guess with my mentors, I saw a, uh, I guess, a, a greater mission, larger potential in academia for the first time, uh, research, and just how much um, more influence and, um, you know, exposure you could have and you know, it just kind of came naturally. I mean, it was te- teaching was easy, you know, for me. I mean, I never had a hard time at it. It just came naturally. I mean, it just I never had to struggle with with anything. I don't know. It was just like a, it, was, it was just easy uh, uh, as far as just teaching. And, and, and you know, I, don't know, I just got a lot of you know pleasure out of um, exposing students to the field because there were. Um, you know, geography, there's so few few people who know anything about geography, much less GIS. Yeah. And, of course, my eventual goal was to be at an HBCU um, eventually. So, um, so I spent four years at Austin Peay State University. I had an excellent opportunity there because we uh, started a geography degree program there. So it was a great experience just coming out coming out of grad school um, because I got involved with curriculum design, course development. Um, you know, I taught all the courses I wanted to teach. I taught environmental management, environmental assessment, um, technological hazards in the environment, physical geography. So I taught exactly what I wanted to teach, whereas uh, other job offers I had, what you know, people were like, oh, you're new. Why don't you teach geography of China for three years, and then maybe after so-and-so retires, then maybe you can teach environmental courses but that didn't happen in Austin P. I went right into what I wanted to do um, I was also teaching an environmental justice an environmental justice course at Vanderbilt University as an instructor and I taught 
also taught environmental uh, or hydrogeology at Vanderbilt also. Um, so I was more, I was kind of a physical geographer slash environmental policy um, uh, ex-specialist, I guess, back then. Um, and then I got the opportunity to go to teach at Oberlin College. And so at the time, Oberlin had a very strong environmental studies program. It's all always had uh, under the leadership of David Orr, Dr. David Orr. And so I went there, and they their their objective was to div diversify their, their their environmental studies program in terms of disciplines. So they had the sociologists, geologists, um, you name it. It was a very interdisciplinary environmental studies program, but they didn't have a geographer, so they brought me in to fill that role. And it was a very good experience. Um, it lasted a year. And after that, I felt like, okay, I'm ready to try to make a move to a black college. And so uh, I applied to several schools, Southern, Jackson State, um, Cheney, uh, and TSU, but uh, having when I when I was working at Austin, P I actually lived in Nashville, so I decided to come back to Nashville because it was an easy move. I mean, I already was familiar um, with the city. Nashville is a very uh, has a very high quality of life, um, so it's a good place. Yeah, yeah, it's you know it's a good place to live. You know, nice. It's easy going. I mean, it's, it's not it what it, it wasn't really it still is really. Crowd. It's not like L.A. or Atlanta or anything right. like that. <laughs> right. You know, but then it's not a little, you know, not, it wasn't like Overland, Ohio, which is a little podunk town. You know, everybody knows your business, you know. Right. Um, and then, so it was, um, we only had a, have a minor program here at TSU, but, you know, I was very fortunate to get uh, funds to, to start a lab as soon as I got here. And so, um, even though I, we didn't have the major uh, through the lab. I've, I've been able to do a lot of research and mentor a lot of students uh, through re through getting grants and and all kinds of disciplines. I mean, I've had all kinds of engineering majors, sociology, mass comm. I mean, you name it, uh, come through here and they've you know graduated and moved on and done still doing great things. You know, so um, and that's pretty much where it is now uh just just doing a lot of community outreach um work with the homeless commission uh work with the uh, right now i'm doing a lot of food desert mapping and i've worked with organizations just for food security um uh, we help the local government update their uh, um bus shelter maps or the the because it you know, there was a time when the city didn't have GPS, and we did over here. Um, uh, right now, we've been working in the schools with, uh, you know, we got some funds to build a GIS lab at a uh, local high school. I just installed a weather bug weather station at the second high school. Both of these high schools are uh, amongst the most, I guess, at risk, if you want to call it that, schools in um Nashville. So we're trying to expose some of the young people to this technology early on, hopefully give them some choices, um, some opportunities that might not be traditional. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's the plan. And um and so that that's where we are now. I mean, it's um you know, I've got tenure here now and so I have a lot of freedom to do more things. So just just mainly I wish I had more time to write grants and get some more funding that's the main thing because that's that's always a struggle in higher ed is funding yeah so i was actually going to ask you i was one of the struggles with running the geography lab there at tennessee state so where where did you get your phd at the university of florida gainesville so so when you went there for your master's you just you just finished there just wiped it out and just finished through huh yeah yeah just uh just kept going i mean it wasn't that's outstanding. That's outstanding. And then after that, you went to the Austin P. I, I don't. I didn't. I don't think I knew that you were there and you were able to do all that. And it's and it's outstanding that you know you wanted to go to an HBCU because you know that's. I guess that's been the main problem since integration. You know where some of our best minds and some of our best resources would you know rather take the uh, 
I guess we're going to take the easier route at Virginia Tech or, you know, or University of Florida, but not a lot of people uh, say that, you know, they want to go back to your Tennessee states and your Jackson states. So I really, you know, that's really the one of the main reasons why I wanted to talk to you so so that more listeners can hear that, you know, that there's some of us out there, you know, and um, we hope that, you know, listening to you and uh, it will inspire some more of us to want to give back to our schools as well. So I wanted to get into um, the HBCU um, GIS alias group. Um, I'm a part of that and a lot of great information about jobs and just standard things, a, a great network. Could you talk about how that started or like how that came into existence? Well, years ago, and I can't remember how many, it's been a lot, um, I think maybe in 1995, six, somewhere in the 90s, uh, we still were having the uh, HBCU GIS faculty workshops. I think they were sponsored largely by the uh, um, U.S. Geological Survey and other federal agencies. U.S. BLM was involved, uh, and uh, at one point they were hosted at the University of North Carolina Central, and then that moved up to uh, Howard University uh, through the Urban Environment Institute. And so, like I said, I think I first went to one in 96 six or five at Central, and then I went to a lot of them, a lot of years in a row. I think I probably, it's been at least over 10 years uh, at Howard University. And so through that project, through that um, series of workshops, you know, I met a lot of other people at, at HBCUs uh, who were using GIS. Uh, and then... I, you know, then this whole, then the internet started getting more sophisticated around that time because we went from like 90, I remember when I first, or I first got email like in 94, that's when we just had email, you know, all these, all this other stuff, what, <laughs> that wasn't even in the picture. And so, um, I guess by, I guess by 2003 or 4, when, when all the kind of listservs, you know, you didn't have all this other social media, you kind of had listservs and, uh, message boards, yeah, listservs and message boards. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think I got, you know, just, and a lot of us were trying to communicate with each other, and so I said, well, let me and then, uh, let me start this listserv. It was in Yahoo. That's how long I'm still, Yahoo's still around, so it's still a Yahoo group. And that's where it started, just getting names of people who were attending the um, HBCU GIS workshops. Um, and then I guess... The last workshop we had was in 2005, and, and what actually happened was a lot of the funding got pulled out because um, of, uh, you know, 9-11. You know, after 9-11, a lot of federal resources just went into Homeland Security. I mean, you know, a lot of resources that used to be in you know, education or mm -hmm. or environmental or, or concert or whatever, it, you know, it just all got sucked in home. Homeland Security, and so we tried to, I guess, leverage those resources for a while. But you know, most HBCUs, especially at that time, you know, we've had made some gains since. But at that time, we just, you know, that just wasn't our thing. I mean, it just, you know, the whole defense contracting sort of thing. I mean, it just wasn't what we were into. Um, I mean, there's more of a presence now. I mean, you see some HBCUs. Uh, uh, getting NGA, uh, you know, there was an NGA HBCU program for a while, and several HBCUs got those grants. But, the, you know, with the big multi-million dollar um, 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 defense contracts and defense research contracts, we, you know, we weren't getting those. I mean, uh, right. so we, and so there was less of an interest in funding the GIS um, the GIS um, workshops for HBCUs because we were pri our primary mission obviously was to teach and most of our uh, activities at the workshops were you know how do we infuse GIS into the curriculum and that was primarily it. and then the second half was just exposing uh, faculty to uh, agencies that might hire students so and I don't remember there being there was very little presence of the defense uh, folks at those 
early conference meeting. It was EPA, USGS. Um, but anyway, that's that's what happened. So after 2005, that's the last one that we had like that. I mean, there there have been smaller ones. I mean, I've gone. I've been. I just did a GIS workshop at uh, Bennett College, in North Carolina A and T. I'm planning on doing one at Arkansas Baptist College. So I've just myself, I've been doing, you know, spot GIS workshops here and there on site. But, you know, but what we had back then was just a, you know, a large collaborative. But, but I guess fortunately, um, once that base was established after the um, HBCU um, work GIS workshops, uh, I've just been able to keep going to add more people. You know, every time I meet people at ESRI, um, uh, for a while I was doing the GIS workshops for the National Society of Black Engineers, and I was also doing the GIS workshops for um, uh, manners, um, minorities in agriculture and natural resources related sciences. So, um, so I, you know, so it's across the board just meeting people and just building up. I think we're close to 300 or, I know we're over 300 people on the list now. Uh, somewhere between 300 and 400. I don't know, it's hard to keep track of some of this. But, um, you know, going out to um, San Diego for ESRI, meeting people, building it there from there. And I, I try to keep it pretty much opportunities based, you know, grant opportunities, um, um, scholarship opportunities. I've, 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 I've known of other, I've known of people that have, you know, got jobs off of the listserv. They, you know, posted their resume and somebody on the list said, hey, I've got, the, or I know of a position and they applied for it and got it. So, so that's really what it's for, it's for opportunities. Uh, it's not so much. I've been on other lists where people are debating and all that. I try to, unless I find a really, really good article or, or if other people want to post like a really, uh, an article that really speaks to what we're about on list, then I'll, you know, post it. Or, or sometimes people have questions about different things. Uh, but, I mean, we st stay away from, you know, the debates and, you know, all that. They, the, the kind of thing that can ruin a listserv. You know, I've seen, I've, I've been on listservs where people get to blaming each other. and you know, or, or you're on a list that you get so much stuff. I mean, you just get bombarded right. with, with all this stuff that eventually you're like this is just too much so I try to keep it to about two two or three messages a week maybe uh, sometimes I'll go a while without saying anything if I don't you know I mean sometimes I don't you know, if they, no, there's nothing out there sometimes some, nobody sends anything in so um, but you know we've been able through listserv to kind of start a little networking group at ESRI amongst HBCU faculty and interested parties and that's been uh, going on for a while. We just meet on Monday nights at the top of the Hyatt and just chat and network. And it's um it's resulted in some pretty uh you know, some tangible results. I mean uh, anecdotally, I mean I know that with this workshop I did at um at North Carolina Ante and Bennett I originally had a different school as a partner, but they, they, they fell out at the last minute. And so I remembered that a, a colleague that I had met uh, at ESRI through our networking, um, Tony Graham at North Carolina A&T, I contacted him, and he just came through, you know, and said, yeah, you can use our lab over here. And, and so we we were able to, to carry that out. It was great, you know. So that's the kind of thing that we want to do is, is be able to reach out, work together, um, there's been some discussion out of that group about starting a um, special interest group, HBCU special interest group within ESRI, um, but I don't know. I mean, we'll see when we get out there this year. I told them I, I don't have time to do it. I said, I'm not even – I'll maintain the list serve. I'll keep them. But that, I don't even want to put myself out there and then have you all be disappointed because I'm just too busy. But I said, if anybody else wants to do it, fine. Just let me know. I'll do anything to support it. A couple people stepped up and said that they're going to try to get us uh, special interest group status in ESR. I don't know. I haven't heard anything. So, which is exactly what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to be like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then everybody, what's up? You know, where, where's the list? Where's the SIG? Where's the SIG? Where's the SIG? And nothing's happening. I'm like, no, no, no. I know right now I'm too busy to do that. But I'm, I'm satisfied with what we've been doing. I mean, it's been very effective, I think. And, and not everything has to be formal and, you know, and, bylaws and the committees and all that. I mean, just people get together, exchange
exchange cards, stay in touch through lists, and, you know, maybe you can hook up on a grant, hook up on a contract, or, or things like that. So, but that's basically the function of the list, just basic opportunities for networking. That's just about it. Yeah. That's outstanding. That's outstanding. So, we're at the end of the interview. I want to give you some time to um, give the listeners all the information so they can get on there. But just just talking to you, you know, in my experience, I believe it's been effective. Um, I've been able to um, – I work at, currently work at ESRI, and uh, I've sent out, you know, uh, emails on the uh, on the alias and, and, you know, about jobs and potential opportunities there at ESRI. And uh, I know one person – uh, for sure, has uh, <clears throat> was able to respond, and they're in the interview process now. So I definitely know that it's uh, it's beneficial, and um, haven't been able to be out and stay at any user conferences for a while. We'll see what happens with me this year. Uh, but yeah, like you said, just to go out and shake someone's hand or to connect the name with the face, um, it, it 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 goes a long way. Just like you said, you were able to go to A and T and. Um, they were able to, you know, uh, they were able to help implement the uh, the workshop that you had. So it's just great. It's just great information. Could you tell all our listeners, um, like all the information? Uh, I know you have a Facebook, so but you give all us all the information so they could be a part of that or even, you know, try to help out to support it. Yeah, probably the easiest way is just to email uh, HBCU GIS Group at Yahoo dot com hbcu gis group at yahoo dot com or send an email to tsu gis lab at gmail dot com and just say that you would like to join the hbcu gis list uh either one of those is what will get to me and i'll i'll just add you to the list okay great great and um and on facebook um how how do we get to you on facebook um i guess if you I'm at, if so, let me think. My Facebook page, I think it's uh, facebook.com slash geo mental, G E O mental. Um, I believe that's it. Or just Google, or I mean, not Google, just uh, go on to Facebook and search for geo mental. Okay. And that should, I'm pretty sure it's, it's Facebook. You know, you never really search for your own page. Right. Yeah, should be, yeah, just search, just facebook.com slash Geo Mental, G E O M E N T A L, and that should get you right to. It. And um, then I can uh, add folks to the. Um, you know, to, we also have a uh, social networking group on Facebook. There's only there's very few people on that one. I haven't really pushed it, but uh, either way, um, is uh, fine as long. You know, once people uh, get on and. And net, start networking and talking to one another. I mean, that's the you know, that's the best way to get relationships started. All right. Well, that sounds good. I really appreciate your time, Doctor Pageant. And um, you know, like I said, like I said, we'll definitely be uh, definitely be in touch. And I'll definitely let you know if I'll be able to be at the uh, user conference and actually to be able to stay this time. Last couple of times, I just have to go out there to set up, and then they let me go home. But well, let me see. We'll we'll see if I'm have to stay there any longer this year. Okay, I'm definitely, I'm definitely, I'm definitely planning on being there. Okay, sounds good. Well, thanks again, Doctor Patrick. Okay. Oh, all right. You take care. Okay. Okay. All right, we're back, and there we you should be back. That's right, we're back, and thanks to Doctor Patrick for his time uh, for the interview. It was good to catch up with him, and you know I'll always be you know in gratitude uh, to him. If you are into GIS and interested in information for the alias, you can find it at HBCUGIS at yahoogroups.com, and you can find the Facebook page HBCU space GIS user group. Uh, that's uh, HBCUGIS at yahoogroups.com and HBCUGIS user group on Facebook. 
If you are interested in becoming a sponsor or a patron to the Marching Podcast, please contact the show and we'll give you this criteria so that we can start to pub your business using our platform. We will play your commercial. We will post your website on our blog and we will help send out your information through social media. So contact us so we can help build your business. Again, you are welcome to call in during the commercial break or leave any comments. We got uh, good people. Jeff, and we got Jeff. Well, I don't know if Jeff and Sharon Reed, but we got at least Jeff on here from the Reeds starring and talking HBCU news with the Reeds. Uh, they'll be coming on. It's, it's Wednesdays. I believe it's Wednesdays. Uh, or two, I think it's Tuesdays. Forgive me for not knowing off the hand, but I, th- I believe it's Tuesdays. And uh, we'll be coming on and hearing great information from them. We were just talking about one of their great articles tonight about Grambling. So go on to hbcunews.net and check that out. We'll hear from them and other sponsors here before we sign off from the show. Again, you're welcome to call in uh, if you want to or leave a comment in the chat room. So we'll go ahead and hear from our beloved sponsors one last time before we sign off. Having an anniversary party, birthday party, or better yet, you're about to marry that special someone? Liquid Effects Photography is the perfect choice to immortalize all your most special moments. With 10 years of dependable professional service that can deliver from the conventional to the best in cutting edge technology and creativity. Come experience the uniqueness of Liquid Effects Photography. We serve the entire upper Midwest and will travel further upon request. Come check us out at liquideffects.com. That's L I Q U I D E F F E X dot com. Or call us at 773 454 5556. That's 773 454 5556. Do you know where to find scholarship information and other financial resources that are available to HBCU students? Are you up to date on the latest information in the HBCU world? If you answer no to any of these questions, then HBCU News with the Reads is the place for you. We provide information to spark interest, success stories of graduates, and the latest on issues that you care about. So check out HBCU News with the Reads, Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on blogtalkradio.com forward slash marching podcast. Check out our website and point your browser toward hbcunews.net and join in on the calls and discussion today. Block Band is a minority-owned music business that you can think of as your assistant band director. We help grow your musicians with a great selection of traditional concert band music. Then we back up their performance with necessities like reeds, oil, drum heads, drumsticks, and mallets. Finally, we outfit your players in auxiliary and shoes, spats, and gloves that match our precise custom drills. Got band? If so, then Block Band's got you. Check blockbandmusic.com or call us at 919-698-2560. That's blockbandmusic.com, 919-698-2560. Attention high school directors and alumni. Does your band need to raise money to travel, buy instruments, or uniforms? Are you looking to raise money to help your band? Well, Big Deal Fundraising is rapidly becoming one of the largest distributors of fundraising products in the industry. Big Deal is based in New York City and ships anywhere in the United States, offering quality products, fast delivery, and innovative consultation that will help you meet your fundraising goals. Call today at 855-244-4430 or visit us at BigDealFundraisingUSA.com. Big Deal Fundraising, your fundraising partner for your band or music ensemble. What if there was a Facebook for bands? Wait a minute, there is. Bandhead.org. Bandhead.org is a social network for HBCU show bands. You can create your own profile and post videos, photos, and comments on Bandhead.org. Need somewhere to post events, audition schedules, job postings? Check out Bandhead.org. Are you recruiting for talent? Go to Bandhead.org. And coming this fall, HBCUBands.com. Write that down, HBCUBands.com. Are you ready for this year's College Battle of the Bands? Well, look no further than the 90 Degree Show brought to you by the Marching Podcast. Every Sunday during the college football season at 8 p.m. Eastern, we recap the most intriguing battles of the weekend and give you, the listener, an opportunity to voice your opinion on the battle by calling into the show and talking with our panelists. Check us out on Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern at blogtalkradio.com slash marching podcast. The 90 Degree Show, the world's first and only interactive HBCU band podcast show. 
Okay, we're back. And I think that is all. I think there are all the sponsors. I, I go through this audio list up and down. And uh, I know I've been getting all excited about the transition music coming in. So I have another Tennessee cut that I want to play, a uh, Tennessee State um, track that I want to play from them this year. And we'll play that on the way out. You know, we, we all, I always start chopping it up show and um, end it with um, Jackson State's rendition of Neck. Um, but found a couple of Tennessee State tracks, and we'll be using them, you know, throughout the 90 Degree Show. And I thought it was going to be uh, appropriate uh, for tonight playing it for Dr. Patrick. I'm sure he's a, a aristocrat of bands fan uh, himself. <clears throat> and Nakia as well. Nakia, I think she went to Tennessee State. You know, she started at Jackson State, uh, but but definitely I'm sure. So, you know, we showing them and Tennessee State some love tonight. For that great GIS program and uh, – you know what they're doing there. So um, that's all the time we have for the show tonight. I would I had the the call lines open, and you know, uh, looks like Jeff and I one one other person, Jeff and I, we've been sitting here t- uh, talking over the uh, the chat room. So we appreciate the people in the chat room, and um, we'll go ahead and um, start to end the show. Let me see here if I get my bearings here right. We'll end the show. Um, but uh, uh, we want to thank uh, David A. Paget. And Tennessee State for his time. Check out the website and donate what's in your heart to the marchingpodcast.com. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Thanks to you for listening. And remember, the eye is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Advice may be misleading, but examples are always clear. See you next time.